Uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, Lisa Lee's uh, PhD defense. Um, uh, so she's going to be talking about learning embodied agents with scalably supervised enforcement learning. A um, couple of uh, logistical pieces for all the audience. Uh, Lisa is going to give a you know approximately forty five minute talk. Uh, during the talk, if you have any clarification questions, you could ask. But if you have like more in depth questions, we can uh, we should wait until uh, the end of the presentation. Um, after Lisa's presentation, we're going to go in. in uh, uh, the committee members will be asking questions, starting from the most remote. I think in this case that would be Eric, but because Eric is a is a core <coughs> well, supervisor, we'll probably start with uh, Chelsea and we'll go with Sergey and then. Uh, the advisors. Um, and then we're going to open up to the audience if uh, uh, there's any question. Um, so I think on that point, uh, Lisa can start. Oh, one other um, uh, point I wanted to make is that if you can mute yourself, uh, I know there's a, quite a few people listening. While Lisa is uh, giving her presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, take it, uh, take it away, Lisa. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um yeah, um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming to my um, thesis defense. Um, my talk is titled Learning Embodied Agents with Scalably Supervised RL. And um, the people on my thesis committee are uh, Russ Salakutunov and Eric Shing, who are my PhD advisors, and Chelsea Finn and Sergey Levine, who I also worked with uh, while I was at Google. Um, yeah, I uh, guess. So um, in this talk, we will be concerned with um, how to train a generalist robot that can quickly solve a wide variety of tasks, such as being able to pick and place many different types of objects. Such generalist capabilities remain a challenge for modern RL algorithms. And to deploy RL agents in the real world, I imagine that we'll have a factory of robots where the agents do task agnostic training to learn useful skills and motor primitives. Then. Um, then each agent is deployed to someone's house where the agent has to quickly adapt to the tasks specified by the human. Um, how can we train such an agent? The common approach to learning many tasks with RL is to first manually design many reward functions and then run RL on these tasks, such as uh, meta reinforcement learning or multitask reinforcement learning methods. Um, however, uh, one of the biggest challenges for RL is that designing a good reward function is really difficult, especially in high dimensional real world problems. For example, consider the problem of learning humanoid acrobatic skills. Um, the, these are the corresponding reward functions. Trying to design a reward function for a complex task can be tricky and require a lot of manual labor to fine tune and tweak the reward function. Um, Instead of relying on reward functions, an alternative approach is to learn to imitate some expert behavior. This is called imitation learning, where you learn a policy that matches the expert behavior either in trajectory space, state action space, or state space. And within imitation learning, um, inverse RL is the problem of learning a reward function that explains the expert behavior. These methods require expert demonstrations, which can be obtained from various sources, such as motion capture data, polyoperation, and kinesthetic demonstrations. One caveat is that expert demonstrations can be expensive and time consuming to provide. Um, and moreover, the demonstrations may not be perfect. So it remains, it remains an open question of how to explore and extrapolate beyond the suboptimal demonstrations. Another way to train an agent without a hand design reward function is to automatically learn a reward function from interacting with the environment. This is the focus of self-supervised RL methods. For example, predictive error exploration methods encourage the agent to explore new and unseen states. These methods learn a predictive model F whose error is used as an intrinsic reward to encourage exploration towards less familiar states. Here's a video of an agent that is rewarded with novel experience in the maze environment. One challenge is the noisy TV problem, where if the, noise, uh, if the maze has a noisy TV setup, the agent would be attracted and stop moving in the maze. So while there has been a lot of progress in self-supervised methods, um, there are several open challenges. 
One is that these methods are simple and efficient and prone to underfitting, especially in large and high dimensional search spaces. It's also unclear how to quantify what is good exploration as that can depend on the domain and the task. And lastly, it's unclear how to incorporate domain knowledge into the exploration algorithm. To summarize, um, in supervised RL, we use extrinsic rewards or expert demonstrations to supervise the agent. And the downside is that the cost of human supervision is expensive and obtaining such forms of supervision can be difficult in many real world problems. On the other side, in self-supervised RL, the agent learns on its own by interacting with the environment. These include intrinsic rewards for exploration, mutual information objectives, and goal-conditioned RL. While these methods do not require an extrinsic reward function provided by a human, um, these self-supervised approaches are notorious for being sample inefficient and computationally expensive to train. Can we find a balance between self-supervision and human supervision? When thinking about scalably supervising RL, there are a number of desiderata to consider. Um, the first is a convenient user interface that allows the human to easily interact with the agent. For example, we do not want the human to spend too much time designing a complicated reward function and tweaking many hyperparameters. Instead, we want the supervision to be more like training a dog, where supervision is easy to provide and the interface is accessible to anyone without requiring a lot of expert domain knowledge. The user should also be able to provide multimodal supervision signals, for example, using both verbal instructions and visual cues. We also want the learning algorithm to be data efficient, both respect to the number of environment interactions as well as the number of human labels. We should be conscious of how much time the human needs to spend supervising the agent. And we should also try to utilize that supervision in order to drastically cut down the number of environment interactions needed. This requires that we have effective interaction between the agent and the human. In order to achieve effective um, human agent interaction, the agent needs to have efficient exploration capabilities. Uh, in other words, the agent should be equipped with the ability to um, explore interesting and novel states so that the human can provide feedback on a diverse range of behaviors. The agent should also be able to explore in a safe and controllable manner so that the agent can learn on its own without requiring constant supervision. With all of these points in mind, here's the outline of the talk. Um, in part one, our focus will be on how we can efficiently learn to explore. We want to understand what prior exploration methods are doing and why they work. We want to quantify um, what is good exploration and how we can amortize the cost of learning to explore. We will also look at learning a stationary reward function for exploration. Um, in part two, we will look at how we can learn semantically disentangled representations from scalable forms of supervision and how we can use the disentangled representations to benefit RL. In particular, um, we will look at how to introduce structure into goal-conditioned RL using weak supervision and also look at solving language specified tasks with attention. Throughout the talk, we will be mindful about the cost of human supervision and consider alternative modalities of supervision that can be more scalable and easier to provide from the human. We will show that such supervision can benefit both exploration and representation learning for RL. Uh, we'll start with the uh, first part on exploration. Having a good exploratory policy is often critical in RL. Here's a typical learning curve for RL when you train on a task with sparse rewards. Most time is spent on exploration, but once you find the goal, RL can solve the task quickly. Exploration is important for representation learning, which rely on having a balanced data distribution that is collected from doing efficient exploration. And it's also important for effective human feedback. Without good exploration, the human will not be able to provide useful feedback or information to the agent. There has been recent progress on self-supervised exploration methods, many of which are based on predictive error. However, these methods have two limitations. First, they lack a well-defined objective to quantify good exploration, but rather argue that exploration arises implicitly through some iterative training procedure. 
So we lack a way to measure what is good exploration and a metric to evaluate these exploration methods. We also lack an understanding of what these methods are doing and why they work. It's also unclear how we can incorporate domain knowledge into the exploration algorithm. The second limitation is that uh, these methods tar target the single task setting. This means that after learning to explore for one task, they need to learn to explore again for the next task without being able to reuse the exploration knowledge from previous tasks. Learning to explore from scratch for each task is expensive. Um, so to address these limitations, we will think about how we can measure exploration and how we can amortize the cost of learning to explore. Um, and to address these limitations, uh, in this section, we will um, study the state marginal matching objective. This objective tries to match the blue and orange distributions where the blue histogram is the policy's state marginal distribution and the orange line is a fixed target distribution, P star. Um, SMM measures how often the policy visits states that are considered good under the target distribution and provides a formal objective to quantify what is good exploration. After learning a policy that matches the target distribution, we can use this policy to amortize exploration. Intuitively, if the target distribution captures the goal distribution at test time, then a state marginal matching policy can explore quickly at test time to find a goal by visiting states proportionally based on the target distribution. By learning a single exploration policy with SMM that can be reused across tasks, we can amortize the cost of learning to explore in a multi-task setting. Another motivation is that the target distribution can be a way to tell your agent how to do exploration. For example, you can tell the agent that it should spend about 40% of its time outdoors and 60% of its time indoors. In this way, SMM provides a convenient mechanism to incorporate prior knowledge through the target distribution, P star. Let's look at the uh, state margin matching objective more closely. What is the reward function? Note that this objective is equivalent to maximizing this reward function inside the expectation with a state entropy regularized policy. Intuitively, the objective says to put more reward on states you don't visit enough and less on states that you visit too often. The objective depends on the policy pi in two places. Um, uh, first, to compute the expectation, we sample states from pi. And second, inside the expectation, we compute the density under pi. So we have this cyclic dependency where the reward function depends on the policy, so we can't just apply standard RL. We note that standard RL does not match state marginals, um, and instead its reward maximization objective will produce a policy that goes to the mode of the target distribution. A solution around the cyclic dependency problem is to learn a state density estimator Q. Then the objective becomes a two-player zero-sum game between the policy and the density. How do we optimize this objective? We alternate between sampling states from the policy, updating the density with the states visited by the policy, and updating the policy with the reward defined by the density. We repeat this process for a number of iterations, optimizing the objective with respect to the policy, then with respect to the density. However, games such as rock, paper, scissors illustrate that such a greedy approach is not guaranteed to converge to a stationary point. But a slight variant called fictitious play does converge to a Nash equilibrium in finite time. In fictitious play, each player chooses the best action with respect to a historical average of the opponent over past iterates. In our algorithm, the density tries to fit the state marginal with respect to a historical average over the policy iterates, and the policy tries to visit states that have low density under a historical average of the density model. In practice, we can efficiently implement historical averaging over policies by maintaining a replay buffer. And most importantly, the exploration policy that our method returns is the historical average policy and not the last policy. How can a state marginal matching policy help us amortize the cost of learning to explore? Let's consider a robotic manipulation task where at test time, a goal location is sampled uniformly along the table surface and the agent's task is to move the block to the goal. The optimal state distribution would 
to place uniform density over the table surface since a good exploration policy would explore by moving the block to different coordinates along the table surface in order to quickly find the goal. On the other hand, RL would learn a policy that converges to go to the mode of the target distribution. Likewise, predictive error exploration methods target the single task setting, and they do good exploration along the course of learning the single task, but the final, conver uh, the final policy at convergence is often not a good exploration policy for solving other tasks. Here's a policy trained with state marginal matching, which converges to a more stochastic exploratory behavior. We measured the state entropy of the policies after training. SNM explores more than the baselines as indicated by the larger state entropy. Next, we measured test time exploration and evaluated how much time it takes for the uh, trained policy to find the goal. We found that our SMM algorithm achieves higher success rate in finding these goals at test time, indicating that higher state entropy is indeed useful for fast adaptation. We also ran experiments on the hardware declaw robot, which is a nine degree of freedom claw robot. We measured how much the trained policy rotates the object on the bottom. Again, we found that the state entropy reward helps the policy obtain a larger coverage of states, even in real world settings. These experiments show that having a policy that tries to maximize state entropy and visit many different states is, is a good exploration prior for solving downstream tasks. We provide a connection between the state marginal matching objective and uh, mutual information objectives for RL. To be able to capture more complex target distributions, we consider using a mixture of policies. In this case, we train multiple latent condition policies and their average state visitation defines the state marginal of the policy. In this mixture case, our objective produces a reward of this form, which has a nice decomposition. The first state prior term says to go to states with high density under the target distribution. The state entropy term says to explore a wide range of states. The diversity term says that the latent condition policies should each visit different states. And the latent entropy term says that we should explore a wide range of latent skills. This decomposition resembles mutual information objectives in prior work, but these methods omit the state entropy term. Thus, a one interpretation of our work is that it explains that mutual information objectives almost perform distribution matching. And we can look at the differences and similarities to understand these prior exploration methods better. Our SMM algorithm also looks similar to predictive error exploration methods, which alternate between training a policy and training a model whose predictive error is used as an intrinsic reward for encouraging exploration. In our algorithm, when the target distribution is uniform and we use a BAE density model, then the uh, state marginal matching objective has the following form, where F denotes the VAE autoencoder and R is the KL penalty on the encoder for the, the data distribution. Note that this objective looks similar to previous exploration methods, except that they lack the KL penalty in their loss function. And these methods uh, do not do historical averaging, which means that the method is not guaranteed to converge. However, these methods nonetheless excel at solving hard exploration tasks, and we draw an analogy to fictitious play to explain their success. Over the course of training, the policy will visit a wide range of states. In other words, the replay buffer stores a historical average over the policies, so these methods train on a diverse range of experience, which possibly explains why these methods succeed at solving hard exploration tasks. Thus, another interpretation of our work is that it explains that predictive error exploration is approximately doing state marginal matching. And we can use our analysis of SMM to understand how these prior exploration methods work. SMM predictive error exploration and adversarial imitation learning algorithms such as Gale learn a reward function that is non-stationary uh, due to the adversarial nature of the objective function. In other words, the reward function evolves over the course of the, uh, training the two-player game between the reward and the policy. This means that after convergence, you cannot use the learned reward function to train another policy from scratch. Can we distill exploration into a single stationary reward function? Importantly, we want this to be a reward function such that if we apply an off-the-shelf RL algorithm on it, it will converge to a good exploration policy. 
um, the, uh, this reward function would reflect the dynamics of the environment. So when solving a new task in this environment, we could use this reward to get good exploration tailored to the task at hand. In a follow-up paper, we proposed a method to learn a stationary reward function. First, we write out the SNM objective using the maximum entropy RL framework, where theta is the reward parameter. Then our method learns a reward function by doing gradient descent on the SNM objective. In our paper, we derive the analytical gradient with respect to the reward parameters theta, and we call our algorithm FIRL. Our algorithm will output a stationary reward function such that if you train reward, uh, RL from scratch on this reward function, then you will get a policy that matches the expert state distribution. Here's an example on the half tuta task. Given either expert trajectories or a target state distribution, our algorithm outputs both a policy that imitates the expert state distribution and a stationary reward function. This reward can be reused to train another policy from scratch, and this policy will also learn to imitate the expert behavior. Why should we learn a stationary reward function and where can it be useful? One use case is that the reward provides a metric to evaluate and compare trajectories in the offline data. As another motivating scenario, we considered using the learned reward for transfer learning across changing dynamics. We first trained a stationary reward function from the expert tra trajectories generated on the healthy ant body. Then we tried training a disabled ant with two of its legs disabled and shrunk using the learned reward function. We found that our FIRL reward enables the agent to learn to move forward with just the remaining two legs. Um, to summarize this section, uh, we tried to answer the questions, how, how do we measure exploration? SMM provides a formal objective to quantify what is good exploration, and it also provides a convenient mechanism to incorporate prior knowledge through the target distribution. How can we understand what previous exploration methods, uh, methods are doing? Um, we explained that predictive error and mutual information exploration methods almost perform distribution matching, but they omit historical averaging and the state entropy term. We also relate exploration with imitation learning. How can we amortize the cost of learning to explore? We learn a task agnostic exploration policy or reward that can be reused to solve downstream tasks. We covered the first part of this talk, uh, of this talk on how we can efficiently learn to explore. And the second half uh, will be on learning disentangled representations for vision, language, and control. Why do we want to learn disentangled representations for RL? Let's look at manipulation tasks as an example. In almost any real world environment, there will be many factors of variation in the environment, including the robots and the vector position, the shapes, sizes, and colors of different objects in the scene, the table surface color and texture, the lighting condition of the room, and so on. In the real world, it's impractical to have sensors to measure every possible factor of variation. And one practical solution is to use image observations from a camera and try to disentangle the environment state from the pixels. This, uh, this disentangled representation can be very helpful for the agent to figure out how its actions affect the state of the world. And a human interpretable representation can also allow um, human agent interaction using language. For example, the human can instruct the agent to place a yellow block on top of the red block. In this section, we will think about how we can learn disentangled representations in a scalable way and how the disentangled representation can be used to benefit RL. Here's an overview of this section. First, we will introduce structure into goal conditioned RL by using weak supervision. Then we will look at solving language specified tasks using attention. The focus of this section is on how we can learn language, vision, and control together using scalable forms of human supervision. I'll start with the first section on introducing structure into goal-conditioned RL. I'll give a brief overview of a goal-conditioned RL. Um, in goal-reaching task, the agent receives a goal and attempts to solve it. For example, in the door task, the goal is to open the door at a certain angle, and in the push and pick up task, the goal is to move the object to some goal position. 
The space of goals defines the family of tasks that the agent has to learn to solve. And goal-conditioned RL is an approach for learning to reach all the goals. The agent proposes its own goals to practice by sampling a goal from some distribution P. Then the agent attempts to solve the proposed goal by rolling out its policy, which is conditioned on both the current observation and the goal. Then the agent uses the experience to update its policy. It uses a goal-conditioned reward function that measures how close the agent got to the goal. Learning a single policy to reach all the goals is a challenging optimization problem and is prone to underfitting in high dimensional tasks. For example, if the goals are images, then randomly sampling a goal in the space of pixels will most likely result in a meaningless image. It's also unclear how to define distances between two images. To solve visual goal condition RL, Recent work proposed using a VAE to encode the image observations into a smaller latent space. It samples goals from the VAE prior, which is the standard Gaussian, and uses L2 distance in the VAE latent space to compute the goal distance. A problem is that the VAE may not capture meaningful goal distances accurately. For example, in the door task, the true goal distance function measures the difference between the current angle of the door and the goal angle. And the distance function does not care about the color of the table or how bright the environment is. In this section, we will think about how we can learn a semantically meaningful representation for goal conditioned RL um, and uh, that can disentangle um, useful information about the state. Our work proposes weak supervision as a scalable way to introduce structure into goal conditioned RL. The main idea of our work is to use weak supervision to learn a disentangled representation of observations and goals, which is then used to guide exploration and goal generation for RL. Motivation for using weak supervision is that it is easy and intuitive for humans to specify and can be collect uh, scalably collected from non-expert humans through crowdsourcing. For example, we show a human to compare two images of a robot arm and a door, asking them pairwise binary questions such as, is the door wider for the image on the left? This type of supervision is easy to collect and is often much cheaper to obtain than hand designing effective reward functions. This disentangled representation encodes the input image into a low dimensional latent vector where each latent dimension corresponds to a factor of variation in the environment. This, this disentangled representation will allow the agent to focus on learning to reach states along meaningful axes of variation while ignoring the state dimensions that do not matter. For example, the agent can focus on learning to change the door angle while ignoring the color of the table. Ultimately, our approach enables the human user to specify the factors of variation that matter for solving a family of tasks. Our method is agnostic to the underlying disentangled representation learning algorithm. Um, in our experiments, we chose to use a method proposed by Xu et al. because it is provably guaranteed to recover the true disentangled representation under mild data assumptions. In their work, they train a generative model and a discriminator to, in an adversarial fashion, where the discriminator is trained to classify fake versus real data, and the generator is trained to fool the discriminator. And the encoder is trained to approximately invert the generator. We evaluated our method on several visual manipulation tasks involving pushing or picking up an object or opening a door. We increased the task complexity by adding multiple distractor objects, randomized colors, and randomized lighting in the environment. And this made the visual manipulation task considerably more difficult than in prior work. And we will see that the increased complexity causes prior methods to fail. Here, we show performance on the pickup task where the goal distance measures how close the policy moved the object to the goal position. We plot the performance of hindsight experience replay, rig, and skew fit, which all use an unsupervised VAE representation to do goal sampling and define the goal distance function. The red line is our weekly supervised method it learns faster than the baselines and achieves better performance at convergence. Across a wide range of tasks, we found that our method consistently outperformed prior methods in both performance and learning speed. 
The reason for this performance gap is that the semantically disentangled latent space allows the agent to do directed exploration and goal sampling in a much more efficient way than by doing purely unsupervised exploration. To understand this performance gap better, we did a visualization experiment. We sampled different goals in the latent space and recorded the trajectory obtained from rolling out the goal condition policy. Here, the white line corresponds to the trajectory of the blue ball in the rollout. Note that there is correlation between the latent goal value and the direction in which the policy moves the ball. In other words, our method produces an interpretable latent policy where the latent goals directly align with controllable features of the environment. On the other hand, skew fit, which uses an unsupervised VAE latent space, does not exhibit the same property. And this visualization illustrates how a structured latent goal space can allow the agent to do directed exploration and goal generation to learn much more quickly. How practical is our algorithm? We tested whether it works on real world data. We collected about 1300 images on a Franca robot under various lighting conditions. And we used two camera viewpoints to overcome object occlusion. We were able to attain a sufficiently high correlation between the true XY position of the block versus the latent dimension of the encoded image, which suggests that disentangled representations may be useful for training robots in the real world. We also found that about 1,000 weak labels is sufficient for good performance on all domains. And we found that there is no need to label all the factors of variation in the environment. And we just need to label the factors that are relevant for solving the task. This is good news for real world settings, which are much more complex and have many different factors of variation. To summarize, uh, we propose weak supervision as a means to scalably introduce structure into goal condition RL. Using a learned disentangled latent goal space enables directed exploration and goal generation for much faster learning. And I'll pause here for any questions up to this point. Uh, yeah, we'll go on to the next section um, on solving language specified RL, RL tests uh, with attention. Um, um, so language is an intuitive and flexible way for humans to interact with the agent. It enables us to communicate instructions such as place the red ball inside the box. We can also communicate questions, plans, and intentions. How can we equip embodied agents with language grounding? We want the agents to be able to correlate the language with the physical world being sensed and manipulated. And we also want the agents to be able to transfer the knowledge of words and their grounding visual objects to different tasks. For example, uh, when the human asks, what color is this cube? We want the agent to be able to reuse its knowledge of the color red from previous tasks to answer this question. In this section, we look at how we can train an embodied agent to do multimodal learning of language, vision, and control. As a case study, we consider embodied multimodal tasks where we have an agent that acts in a 3D environment and perceives both visual first-person observations of its surroundings, as well as a language instruction or question that specifies its task. In semantic goal navigation, the agent is given a instruction such as go to the green torch and its task is to find the green torch and navigate to it. And in embodied Q&A, the agent is asked a question such as what color is the car? And it has to explore the environment in order to find the car and an answer the question. In these embodied tasks, how can the agent learn semantic concepts of words and map them to their visual observations? In this work, we introduce a dual attention architecture that explicitly disentangles and aligns the knowledge of words and their grounding visual objects. I'll briefly describe how our architecture works. It inputs the current image observation and the language instruction or question that specifies the agent's task. We encode the images into a representation where each channel corresponds to a different word in our vocabulary. The gated attention unit attends to the different channels in the image representation based on the text representation. In this example, the instruction contains the words green and tall. So the gated attention unit will learn to attend to the channels which detect green things and tall things. We propose a spatial attention unit, which is analogous to the gated attention unit, except that it attends 
spatially to different pixels in the image representation rather than the channels. Um, in this example, we would like to spatially append to the parts of the image which contain a green or tall object in order to recognize the type of the object. And finally, the architecture outputs the answer prediction vector and the flattened spatial attention map. And these outputs are then fed into the policy module to compute the next action. And for training the answer predictions, we use a supervised cross entropy loss, and the entire model is trained end to end using PPO. Um, here are some videos of the agent solving tasks at test time on the Doom environment. We visualize the language instruction or question the agent's visual observations, um, the, its intermediate attention representations, and its predicted answer distribution. You can see that our method is able to learn semantic concepts and map them to the visual objects detected in its image observations. And compared to other baselines, our method achieves higher test performance on both semantic goal navigation and embodied Q&A. To summarize, we uh, introduce a dual attention architecture that performs a series of gated and spatial attention operators to perform explicit alignment between its image, uh, learned image representations and word representations. And this allows the agent to transfer the knowledge of words and their grounding visual objects across different embodied navigation paths. And this wraps up the second half of the talk. Um, and now we will discuss the conclusion and future works. To summarize this talk, um, in part one, we looked at how we can efficiently learn to explore. We studied the state marginal matching objective, which provides us a way to measure and understand exploration. In particular, the SNM objective provided a framework to look at previous exploration algorithms based on um, predictive error and mutual information. We found that these, ex uh, the, these previous exploration methods almost perform distribution matching, but omit historical averaging and state entropy maximization, which might explain why they fail to scale to harder tasks. We also related exploration to imitation learning algorithms. And furthermore, we showed how we can amortize the cost of learning to explore by learning a reusable task agnostic expression policy or reward that can be used uh, for solving downstream tasks. Uh, in part two, we looked at how to learn disentangled representations for language, vision, and control. Uh, in the first section, we took goal condition RL and introduced structure into the goal generation process using weak supervision. In the second section, we learned language specified tasks with an attention architecture that learns to disentangle and align words with visual entities. The takeaway message of this talk is that Combining self-supervised RL with scalable forms of human supervision can make the task much easier to learn. It can greatly accelerate the learning speed, improve the generalization performance at test time, and enable better safety and controllability of the exploration during training. And as future work, in order to scale RL to solve harder um, real-world tasks, I think it's important to think about what are alternative scalable modalities of supervision for RL. We want super <laughs> supervision that is scalable to collect and provides useful learning signals for the agent. Our thesis addressed different ways to scalably supervise RL agents for um, exploration and representation learning, but a lot of pieces are still missing. In particular, um, one of the next big challenges is interactive RL. How can humans effectively interact with an agent to quickly teach it new tasks and skills? As a comparison, let's think about how you would train a dog. In dog training, humans can provide sparse rewards to the dog using dog treats. Uh, and, maybe, uh, 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 and maybe you can provide demonstrations for certain tasks. Um, dogs are also equipped with motor skills and intrinsic curiosity that enable efficient exploration and interaction with the human. So what are effective modalities of supervision to train RL agents? For example, we could use sparse rewards, demonstrations, visual cues, kinesthetic teaching, or comparisons between trajectories. And language uh, is a rich and fluid interface that can enable more seamless collection of supervision for robot learning. This list is not exhaustive 
And there are many different forms of supervision that we can utilize to train RL agents. And this is an understudied area in RL. Another question is, how do we handle uncertainty in the supervision provided by the human? The human may make mistakes or forget to provide any feedback. So we need to be able to handle noisy or inconsistent feedback. And the human may also have systematic biases that uh, uh, affect, its, uh, affect their supervision distribution. And the human may also provide suboptimal demonstrations, in which case the agent has to try to extrapolate and learn a more optimal behavior. How, um, and how do we achieve effective interaction between the human and the agent? As discussed earlier in the talk, um, the agent needs to have efficient exploration capabilities in order to produce diverse behavior so that the human can provide more meaningful feedback. And communication from the agent to the human is also essential for interactive RL. It allows the agent to make queries and do active learning. And the transparency about the agent's learning state allows the human to adjust accordingly. Uh, and lastly, how can we quickly adapt given a small amount of human feedback? Uh, a promising approach is to do task agnostic pre-training to learn useful skills and representations. And then after deployment at test time, you do online fine tuning to quickly adapt to your new environment. And during the pre-training process, what should we meta learn? For example, we can pre-train reward functions, um, skills or feature representations. Then at test time, we try to quickly adapt by inferring a reward function, choosing one of the learned skills or doing feature selection. And another open question is, um, what are the right representations and inductive biases for learning the policy and the reward? There are many algorithmic choices that we can try to improve online adaptation. Um, and in addition to online supervision, there are also many large offline data sets that contain rich structured priors about the natural world. For example, we have a lot of real world data in the form of videos and captions, knowledge bases and text, and even offline trajectory data of agents interacting with the environment and performing various tasks. Leveraging these diverse data sets can enable RL agents to achieve better generalization and knowledge transfer to real world tasks. These offline data sets can also help RL with sample efficiency and reduce the number of environment interactions needed, which can be expensive. The goal would be, the goal would be to learn a representation that enables generalization and knowledge transfer across shared semantic concepts. And for the representation, we want to learn not just features about the world, but also learn how the agent's actions influence the environment. So to wrap up, there are many creative ways to supervise RL agents. And I listed some of the next big frontiers that can help scale RL towards solving bigger real world problems. Um, and um, my thesis covers only a subset of the projects I worked on during my PhD. Um, here's a list of other research contributions which are not covered in this talk. This include uh, long horizon planning for navigation, um, visual understanding and representation learning in a vision uh, and other ML applications such as healthcare and database man management systems. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators whom I've learned so much from during my PhD. These people include my advisors and fellow PhD students at CMU as well as collaborators I met through my internships. Um, and lastly, all of the papers in this talk are available online, including the source code. And we've had a number of people build upon our work and use our method in their research projects. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, now we'll take any questions from the audience.